Greetings, everybody, in the name of Christ Jesus, our Lord. Uh, it's Tuesday of Holy Work Week, and we are uh, studying 1 Peter. We're in 1 Peter chapter 2 today. And uh, one of the great things that Peter did for us yesterday is he told us who we are, that we are a spiritual priesthood, that we're living stones that are being built together into the house of God. Uh, you know, the, the Bible's message of who we are in Christ Jesus not our potential of who we might be if we try harder, but actually who we are because of Christ Jesus. It's incredibly comforting. And yesterday, as I mentioned, Peter um, spoke of it as, as uh, being a spiritual priesthood, that we have offerings to make. Not, not offerings that are like animal sacrifices, but rather that we would give an offering of our lips, um, that we would show love and affection for one another. And today, Jesus, or excuse me, Peter speaks of who we are in Jesus and what our purpose is. So not only who you are, but why you're here. And this, too, is incredibly comforting and enlightening. And, and notice that, again, Peter does not speak in terms of what we might do. He says, this is what you do. This is who you are. Um, this is your purpose in the Lord Jesus Christ. Let's get into the text. So today we're, we're just looking at 1 Peter chapter 2, verses 9 and 10. These are colossal passages uh, concerning our purpose in this life. Why does God have me here right now? Um, a number of us have asked that question, right? Why does God have me here? Sometimes the answer is really evident. You know, as we're, we're so busy doing things that we believe are glorifying God, taking care of our family, raising children, um, helping others, being active in our church, um, sharing the name of Jesus. That's why I'm here. But then there's other times in our life when we, we go through troubles and trials. We may be um, suffering physically. It may feel like we can't do anything. And then we ask, Lord, why am I here? Why do you have me here? Peter has an answer for us today. Verse 9. But you are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people belonging to God, that you may declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his wonderful light. But you. You notice how Peter began our passage today with those two short words at the very beginning but you. Whenever you see that in the epistles, when a verse begins with, but you, usually what the holy author is doing is he's comparing Christians to the folks that he just mentioned, and he's distinguishing us from them. Now, the folks that, that Peter ended yesterday's section with were unbelievers, um, those who had rejected the living stone and ended up stumbling on him. That is, they didn't believe in him. And God always has a punishment for unbelief. But you, 
So now Peter is saying, you're different from that. But you are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people belonging to God. That's who you are. You know, I'm reminded of these titles being used by God through Moses for the people of Israel in Exodus chapter 19. So just before God delivered his law to his people, um, he said, you will be a royal priesthood, a chosen people, a, a holy nation, a people belonging to me, a people of my own possession, if, if you are obedient to these commands. There's no ifs in Peter's declaration. Peter speaks the gospel of who we are, not by what we earn, not how we earn it, but simply what God declares us to be. You see, the law of God, which of course is a legitimate word of God, and it's, it is, uh, it's, it's something that courses throughout Scripture. The law of God, however, is always going to be conditional. There's always going to be ifs attached to it. I will be your God if you obey me, if you carry out my commands. That's the law of God. And because that's the nature of the law of God, conditionalized like that, if you seek to approach God only through his law, you're never going to be sure. You're never going to be sure about where you stand with God. There will always be a big if. God will love me if I have done enough. God will be good to me if I've done enough good in my life. See, that's the nature of the law of God, not so the gospel. There are no conditions, no riders attached to the gospel of Jesus Christ. God simply looks at us through Jesus and he gives, he promises. You can't conditionalize a promise, right? Like if I were to say to uh, one of my children when they were, uh, when they were younger, uh, I promise to buy you ice cream if you clean your room. I really misspoke there because you can't attach an if to a promise. God simply promises us grace in Jesus Christ through the gospel. And that's why Peter talks the way that he does. When you have a living Savior, that's God simply saying to you, you are a chosen people, you are a royal priesthood, you are a holy nation, you are a people that belong to me. Okay, well, what's our purpose? If that's who we are, what's our purpose? And that's the second half of verse 9. That you may declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his wonderful light. Now, that word, little word, that is um, expressed by another little word in the Greek that indicates result. This is the result, the factual result, the real result of God making you his people in Jesus Christ. Here's the result. You declare the praises of him. There's no ifs about it. 
uh, the only question is how well, how well we actually declare his praises. And I love this expression of our purpose in life, declaring the praises of God, telling others, telling ourselves, telling God how much we love him, how much we appreciate what he has done for us, how thankful we are, how we want others to be in the family of God. That's our purpose. That's our vocation, to declare, to announce, not to argue, not to debate, but simply to declare, I have a great God. This is what God has done for me, and he can do it for you too. You see, this is our purpose. This is why we're here. How will you declare the praises of the one who called you out of darkness into his wonderful light? How will you do that today? Could it possibly be that in a time of, uh, of pandemic isolation, when there are fears, when there's lots of uncertainty, isn't one of the best ways to declare the praises of our God that we don't panic? That we um, instead speak confidently to one another that God has a plan for this. That the God who has taken care of our, of our biggest problem of sin by removing it in Jesus Christ will also take care of our other problems. We declare the praises of the one who called us out of darkness into his wonderful light. We do that when we speak calmly and confidently to each other, especially in times like this. In verse 10, Peter gives some details of this story that each one of us has. The story of God calling us out of darkness and into his light. So now Peter kind of puts some flesh on the bones of that, of that skeleton, you might say. God has called you. Well, what was the darkness light like? What is the light like? Now he tells us. Verse 10, once you were not a people, and now you are the people of God. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. So the way Peter wants to tell your story and his story and my story is with a tried and true uh, New Testament testimony. You'll, you'll find this in, in many of the apostles in their epistles. It's the once but now. There was a time, once upon a time, you were in a whole heap of trouble because you were separated from God. But now it's different. And the difference is Jesus Christ. Jesus has brought you into the family of God. Jesus is God's mercy, not his wrath. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. When I look at this verse, verse 10, first of all, I'm reminded that whether, whether you or I as Christians have a physical memory of the time when we were without Christ in this life, whether you have a memory of it or not, it was the case. 
because each one of us came into this world via our first birth, we came into this world as the enemies of God. That simply is the, uh, the kind of the startling truth of scripture that we come into this world as the enemies of God. Once you were not my people, once you had no mercy, this is Peter's testimony. And then he speaks of how God turned us around. Now, it could have been very, very early in your life through holy baptism. It could have been later in your life through holy baptism. It could have been later in your life through the word of God. But however God used the gospel in your life, you see what he was doing? He was calling you out of your natural darkness into his glorious light. Once you weren't the people of God, now you are. Once was lost, now am found, was blind, now I see, right? As Peter speaks to us today um, with these once but now expressions, he uses words that certainly echo uh, the Old Testament prophet Hosea. Hosea was a, a man called by God to, uh, to preach God's word to um, both nations of Israel, both the northern tribes and the southern tribes of Israel. And uh, the way that he did that was he, the way he warned the people of Israel who were becoming apostate. They were, they were falling away from the faith. They were, they were turning their back on the Lord their God. And they were giving themselves over to idols. The way that Hosea called them to repentance was the, by naming his children. Not my people and no mercy. So in Hebrew, not my people is lo ami. And, and Hosea named his son that because God told him to. And his daughter, he named lo ruhama, which means no mercy. So that was sort of like an, an, a, an object lesson sermon to the people of Israel that if you continue on this path, if you turn your back on God, you're not going to be his people. And you're not going to be, you're not going to receive any mercy. Peter takes those concepts and he says, that's your past. That's your story, O people of God. Once you were not a people. And once you had not received mercy, but now it's different because of the gospel. Because of what Jesus has done, now you are God's people. And now you have received mercy. How will you declare the praises of the God that has done that in your life? Earlier, I, I talked about how in a time of hardship and uh, in a time when others around us are, are panicking, um, that one of our testimonies as Christians is to, uh, to cling to God in the words that we say. And uh, a friend reminded me of uh, just recently reminded me of the hymns 
of Paul Gerhardt in um, our hymnal, Christian Worship. And they often have this theme of how the Lord uh, gives us hope in the midst of suffering. And because Paul Gerhardt was a, a German pastor um, whose entire life and ministry pretty much was made up by with uh, what what most people would say suffering. Um, his ministry was plagued by war. It was plagued by disease. It was plagued, plagued by unemployment. It was plagued by financial reverses and setbacks. And while Paul Gerhardt was given, oh, uh, close to 70 years of life by God, he was preceded in death, not only by his wife, but by four of his five children. And yet, he could write hymns like, Why Should Cross and Trial Grieve Me? And I want to just read one stanza of this hymn as the closing thought today. I believe that communicating a thought like what we hear in this hymn is one way that we can declare the praises of God to each other and to the folks around us, especially at a difficult time like this. He writes, when life's troubles rise to meet me, though their weight may be great, they will not defeat me. God, my loving Savior, sees them. He who knows all my woes knows how best to end them. God took care of your biggest problem. And he who takes away your sin will also take away the pestilence that is among us. And because that is the case, we can praise God. We can declare his praises to one another. And I hope that that's something that you can do today. Let's pray about that. O oh Lord God, we, we call out to you in a time of distress, in a time of fear, and in a time of uncertainty. And though things may be crumbling around us, we cling to you because you are our solid rock. We ask that you would give us the strength to declare your praises to one another and to use even a time like this to preach your gospel to many, many people. We thank you for the, the sisterhood and the brotherhood of the saints. We thank you for bringing us together into your holy temple. And we ask you to empower us through Jesus Christ to be the royal priesthood that we are. Hear us for Jesus' sake. Amen. Friends, I look forward to seeing you again tomorrow. Uh, we're going to have one more uh, Bible study during this Holy Week, so that'll be tomorrow on Wednesday. Then I'm going to take Thursday and Friday off, Maundy Thursday and Good Friday. Um, and then we'll pick it up again on the Monday after Easter. So one more Bible study, and that'll be tomorrow, and then we'll pick it up again next week. I really do feel um, blessed to be with you in this way, in God's word. May God hold you in his tender care.